it is, it is really refreshing, actually, to see quite different communities, policy, implementation, research, working at difficult problems, using different methods, but actually a lot of dialogue and a lot of, of clearly a lot of work done. Uh, you know, it, it's actually, I think Mike DePledge mentioned, you know, described the afternoon contributions as stimulating. I think that's a very fair description. Uh, and it's, it's a nice, uh, this is a, a really nice conference in this respect because you have these different communities that actually are in dialogue and, and sometimes in conflict, but it's, it, it's, it's great to watch. Um, I just want to touch on four, maybe three uh, themes which I felt cut across things and, and I thought raised some particularly interesting issues that I can't really do justice to the, to the, the extent of everything that was said. Uh, first of all, Come, going back to the morning session, I think we got a very clear picture of how climate change is affecting health um, and adaptation can protect health and well-being. And within that context, specifically for Ireland, in, in, you know, there's a set of groups that, uh, that are going to be most affected. And this might, I suspect, propose some particular problems for Ireland. So in particular, we heard that older people, very young people, um, uh, you know, some of the socioeconomic, uh, so groups with socioeconomic deprivation might be particularly affected. Now, those of you from uh, the healthcare services side of things will be well aware that the demographics for Ireland are pretty stark in respect of population aging over the next decade, 15, 20 years. And in particular, for example, we're going to get twice as many uh, over 85-year-olds in 2030 as we had in 2015. Now, that, that's fine, and it's a, it's a, it's a good thing that, that mortality's been falling and so forth, but that does imply that health and social care demand is going to be increasing over that period by 20 to 40 percent, depending on the service. So that's, that's a, a backdrop to this from the, the, the HSE's point of view, the Department of Health's point of view, and they're well aware of that, and there's, there's planning underway to try to deal with that through a mixture of expanding capacity and, and, and changing the modes of services. But you know that when you play that against the fact that the older groups are more likely to be the ones maybe most affected uh, in respect of adaptation uh, requirements, you, you know, in terms of the, the need, and Vladimir talked about this and Colm talked about this this morning, we're gonna need extra infrastructure investment, we're gonna need some changes to processes and staff training. That might suggest that Ireland has a very particular problem. On the other hand, it occurred to me that given that we are making that much investment over that period in expanding services and infrastructures, that actually in some ways makes it cheaper to make incremental changes. So if we can get the planning right at this stage, we might be able to build sustainability into those new investments. So it could be a sort of fortuitous. If you compare us to a jurisdiction where you're in a static position and you're trying to adapt to climate change and you have to rip out old infrastructure and put in new infrastructure. So that might actually, there might be a silver lining there. Um, the second point that I wanted to, to mention about uh, was kind of summed up at, at the beginning by John O'Neill, who was, was saying, we need to talk. And this is the, the, the sense in which, in this area, there's an unusual need to engage with the public on a whole set of complex, multidimensional choices, uh, some of which have long-term dimensions to them, and people find it difficult to think and, and, and make commitments in the long term. And so we, we heard a lot today about the, the efforts both on the research side and in a, a range of, of policy contexts to try to help people work out ways to facilitate consensus on these difficult choices. And the Imagining 2050 project most obviously, you know, you're trying to come up with imaginative ways to engage with people and help them to think about these decisions in a new way. Um, uh, Helen Mars' uh, discussion within the health system as well. It's not just about the public, but there's also these efforts going on within the system about how do we engage with our own people and get them to make these changes. So I think there's, there's a very interesting amount of that work going on, but I, I don't think we'll ever get beyond the need to do that because that is a particularly difficult thing. We're, we're much better, I think, as, uh, as public institutions at having something within our silo and identifying it and trying to solve it and then moving on to the next thing. This kind of problem where we need to bring the public with us on decisions they don't actually know how to make where we don't really know how to frame them is unusual in this health and environment area and particularly in the climate long run perspective. The third point I wanted to touch on was the, you know, the remarkable need for, and you can see the responses to that need for cross-cutting work um, 
So, uh, you know, Ashling Sheehan talked about the, the, the this extent to which an awful lot of implementations fail because people don't communicate within the system and across the system, and that's absolutely true. But again, we heard a lot today about the, the efforts to, to, to make that cross-cutting stuff work, and, and this notion, I, I guess, in, in Joe and Greg's presentation on the SDGs, that, that we need to have this health in all policies type focus. That's, again, something which the policy system is, doesn't find that comfortable. Um, and we have great examples of it. Healthy Ireland would be a nice example. There are other examples. But this is an area where you can't get away from it in health and environment. There were terrific examples where, you know, it, it, it sort of made it obvious. Uh, uh, Pat Goodman mentioning, for example, emergency planning systems. How could you do an emergency planning system without having all kinds of professions involved? And that has to work for adaptation to work. So, so that, that's an, an, an interesting area. Um, the sort of parallel institutional work that's going on within the climate planning flame, framework with respect to local government and also the, uh, you know, the climate SDG kind of in, uh, efforts to engage local government were interesting as well. There's a sort of parallel in, uh, evolution going on within the policy system and maybe, maybe these different areas can learn from each other because I, I think within this issue, local government might be the stickiest part. And there were some interventions from the floor, I thought, that brought this out too, that local government doesn't always have the capacity we would like them to have. And we give them key responsibilities in the system, but you know, there might just be one person in the local authority, in a particular local authority, who has really important responsibilities. I'm not sure you know, there's enough of them, but we'll see. You know, at least we're going to need to, to support and, and provide as much backup to that side of the system as we can, because I don't think you can do this on a, on a whole of nation basis without bringing in some local uh, expertise and, and presence. Um, the, um, oh yeah, 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 Colin O'Connell also in this context mentioned the cross-cutting work within the DOH and the HSE. You know, so even within departments that work together on a day-to-day -day basis now, admittedly the, the HSE is pretty big, but the challenges even there are, are difficult. Um, the, the fourth point I wanted to touch on was, was came to, more to this afternoon's session specifically, and that is that, to my eye, research is unusually close to policy in this area. I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, in particular, you know, obviously, climate science. The, the latest results from climate science or, or environmental science go straight into the latest IPCC report or you know, into, into the latest work on environment and health uh, by construction. But also, you know, we, we heard about the need for more epidemiology in this area. We need, you know, and broader areas of understanding the actual links between environment and health. But also a whole series of areas that we heard about in the afternoon session around how do we frame and explain and uh, nuance choices for people who will, you know, ideally actually probably know what they should do and want to do, but don't necessarily, aren't necessarily either able to do it or, you know, able to get the, their, their habits changed or whatever it is. And there's a lot of really interesting work going on, as we saw in the afternoon session, whether it's about food choices and food sharing or about, you know, uh, uh, just environmental choices more generally um, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to bring people into that sustainable pattern of behavior. Um, so it's an exciting time to be a researcher from where I sit. Uh, so I, I'll just finish on Stephanie O'Keefe's point at the very beginning. It feels different this year, and, and I think it felt different at the conference, but it feels different on the streets as well. And that might mean that there's an opportunity here, that all this activity that's been happening, the kids getting excited about this stuff, the, the, the coming to fruition of, of a lot of the strategic work within departments and in the HSC and so forth, there might just be an opportunity that we should probably seize to make a lot of progress in the next year, because it's not every year. You know, next year there might be some distraction, uh, a recession or something, God forbid, um, that will come along and, and knock us off the, the tilt, although it would, would fix our climate problem again for a while. Um, so uh, yeah, so th this could be a good year to, to take this stuff forward. So just, I'd like to finish up by thanking uh, the, yourselves, uh, and particularly the, the, the responses to the discussions, which I thought were terrific uh, today. I, I want to particularly thank the, the organizers, Dave Malloy, who kind of kept us in order and got, got this thing set up in the first place, uh, Go West for handling the, the kind of details in the organization of behind the scenes. Uh, really appreciate your work. Thanks. <laughs>